Well, good morning and happy new year. It is great to be in the house of the Lord on New Year's Day, and I'm glad that you chose to join to be with us again this morning. Thank you so much for celebrating the new year. Let's celebrate it right in the, again in the house of the Lord. Um, there's a couple of things you need to know about before we move forward. Uh, the very first one is there are no evening services tonight. You go and enjoy your New Year's Day. Um, if for some of you, it might be taking a nap. I know I heard that is on the agenda for the day is taking a nap. So you go home and take a nap and just enjoy the rest of the evening. Um, and then next or this coming Wednesday, January 4th, we are starting our new Wednesday schedule. So take note of that. Instead of 630, we're moving everything up 30 minutes. So Awanas are still the same. It's from 6 to 730. But the youth study and the um, adult Bible study will be at 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock. Please take note of that, 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock, and then we'll have the choir practice from 7 to 8 o'clock. Um, so everything's just getting moved up. And then next Sunday, we'll have a very special Sunday because Chris Kohler will be getting ordained as a deacon. Uh, we're looking forward to that. You come and be a part of that and come and support that. And last but not least, before we move forward, when we get time to the greeting, make sure you come over and greet Patrick McMillan. He's here with us this morning. It's great to see you back, Patrick. Um, he used to be on the drums for us and have a huge part in our church. He's been serving in the Army out in Kansas. Um, he's here for the holidays, so you make sure you speak to him. Uh, would you join with me as we pray together and start today's service? God, thank you so much for this morning. God, thank you so much for just the freshness and the new beginnings of just what New Year's brings. God, but as we continue to move forward in this service, we pray that you are glorified through it all. But God, may you focus us, focus our hearts and focus our attentions on your will for our lives this year, for 2023. May you bring what it is that you would have us to do, what fresh start that you would want us to begin, what things you would want in our life that maybe are, we have that we need to get rid of. May you expose those this morning. As we start this New Year's Day off, may we start it just focused on you, all attention, and may you be glorified through it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Did y'all have fun last night? It sounded like bombs going off around my house. There was some over here, some over there, just everywhere. But it was a great time. Stand and sing with us this morning. On you today. <clears throat>
today. It's not New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. So that means it's January the 1st of 2023. Now it's like a whole month trying to figure out how to write 2023. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it's hard. It's really, really hard. I promise it's hard. And you're signing like six or two to date, and then some of you it's easy to turn that number into the number of to be, but turning a two into a three is really hard. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, so what happens with New Year's? What do we do for New Year's? Like what is, we did fireworks on Sunday, okay, for your watch. What do people set for the whole year? New Year's resolution or another good word for that is goal. So what does the word resolution mean? A goal or the actual definition, you know? Try something new, so you have to get a whole year. It's a firm decision to do something or not to do something. So, some people, their resolution is to um, maybe, a lot of resolutions kind of go around like working out and being more healthy. You were about to say that, right? So, some people, it might be to do something, maybe like to work out more or to drink more water or to be better. And some things to not do would be to not eat what? <laughs> Junk food. Oh. We just have like Christmas and have family treats, right? And now it's like, oh, I can't do this anymore. But resolutions are things that we decide on and kind of focusing on or a goal that we set up like or a goal that we set up for the year. But do you know that a lot of people will make a resolution today to start something? But come February, some people carry that carry out for February, but then like March, April, if you ask them, hey, what was your New Year's resolution on January 1st, they would say, huh? <laughs> they forget about it. Why do you think it's so easy to forget about a New Year's resolution? <laughs> you don't write it down? <laughs> well, that's a good one. <laughs> Why? <laughs> you don't like to do it? I don't like to do it because I don't like to say what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> But what happens is, I think, a New Year's resolution, you set it for this whole year. Do you know how many days you went the whole year? 365. 365. Over 8,000 hours in a year. So there's so much time that we focus on this whole year, and it's sometimes too much. It seems like it's not enough. Yeah. I think it's right. I think it's right. So... <laughs> When you look at the whole year, it's hard to look at that whole thing. It's in January, you're like, yes, it's a, oh, it's a new year. You're all excited. But then you just kind of keep going with your normal routine and you don't change something that's hard to keep that resolution. There's a verse in the Bible from Psalm 19, verse 24 and 20, you've heard a lot. It says, This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I think if we focus less on the whole year, we can have those goals for the whole year. But each morning when we wake up, we say, God, today is your day that you've given me. And I want to use this day. I want to rejoice and be glad in it. I want to honor you with the way that I act, the words that I say, the things that I do. If we set that goal each morning when we wake up, we open our eyes, we thank God for a new day, and that's our focus, I think it's going to be a lot easier to hold on to those resolutions that we may have or just making better choices. Because if we're thankful for the day, if we're rejoicing, what does that mean? <clears throat> we're celebrating, right? We're celebrating the things that God has given us. And when we focus on those things that God has given us, and we focus our hearts and our minds on the blessings that God has given us, the people that are around us, the things that we have that um, maybe others don't have, those things, when we focus on those things, it opens our minds on the things of God, the things that He's given us. And that way we can make better decisions with each day. And then, if you're doing that, you get into that routine of every day when you wake up, before you put your feet on the floor, my papa boy, he used to always tell us, whenever we were over at his house, he'd say, to wake us up, he'd say, ask me if you do that, ah, 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 and I just roll over, and I got to sleep. But he'd come in and he'd say, put your feet on the floor. That means we were up. He'd say, put your feet on the floor. He went, lay down, put your feet on the floor. So before you put your feet on the floor, you start out on the day. Thank God for the day. Tell them, thank you for the day. Rejoice and be glad of it. And use each day to make the right choice. 
And then, before you know it, you're back in December, and you can look back on a year of focusing on each day and being thankful for what you have. All right? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for the blessings that you give us each day. God, we thank you that you've given us the opportunity um, to worship on January 1st, to start off with the year. God, that's such a great opportunity um, for us to, to focus our hearts and our minds on um, the things above. God, we thank you that you give us each day, um, that each day we can find joy and, and comfort in the fact that you have um, given it to us, that you've given us great gifts, Father, that um, we can use um, to glorify you. God, we thank you for the year's resolution. A lot of us do it with great intentions of starting something new, um, finding a new passion. Some people may decide to dig more to your word. Those are things that we always need to do. Father, starting the year is a great way for us to um, kind of kickstart that. So God, help us um, to realize that a year is a long time, and we have to start that um, each day with that determination to, to fulfill the resolutions that we place on our hearts. So God, we pray today that as we um, celebrate, as we get back into a routine and going to school and Going back to work, all those things that are happening um, here now, we just pray that um, all things that we do will glorify me. God, we love you. We pray you to you. Amen. Amen. Let's continue our praise and worship this morning. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Stand and sing.
pray now for the Lord, for those that are suffering, for those that are marginalized, for those, dear Lord, that need you, for those who are lost, dear Lord. We pray that you would touch them as only you can. And we pray now that you bless us all, and that you would multiply, dear Lord, and that you would use it to build your kingdom. Of course, in your precious name we do pray.
As the choir goes down, let me invite you to come and be a part of the choir. You can uh, come to practices on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. So come and join the choir. They'll be working on a lot of new music and music for the Easter season. So come and be a part. He, he, Zane would love to have you in the choir. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> okay, let's have a prayer. Father, thank you so much for our time to come and to share together in your word. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the new year, 2023. Lord, this morning, help us to stop and think about the opportunities you continue to give us in life. Father, we saw this morning, even in our Sunday school lesson and many of our classes, where you gave Peter the opportunity to walk on water. Lord, there's no telling what 2023 holds for us. But Father, our faith has to be there. Our faith has to be strong. So, Father, may we make that as a resolution for this coming year to have strong faith so that we can reflect Christ to this world around us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love uh, New Year's resolutions, even though a lot of times I give up on them by the... Because I always make one, I'm going to lose weight this year. And then I go home and Cindy's cooked this fantastic meal and it's gone right away. But uh, I'm not even going to say that this year. I'm going to just have in the back of my mind. But one resolution I'm going to truly try to do is to be strong in my faith so that I can reflect Christ even more to this world around us. Uh, I think that is so important for us to see that. So I'm going to be going over uh, very specific points from God's Word over the next few months to help us to get our faith stronger than it is now. Think about it. In anything we do, uh, whether you have to work at it to make yourself better. And that's what we're going to do here in our faith for the next three months. Today I want to start by talking to you about discipline. I read a story about um, Elmer Towns. He's a, a professor at Liberty University. Uh, and he was in... He was out when he was a young uh, teenager. He was hunting one day. And a storm came up suddenly, and he found a small cave up in the mountains where he lives in Virginia area. And he was able to get into that small cave to get out of the rain. And there was enough light coming into the cave that he could see around him close by. And he saw some dry leaves, and he was cold, so he thought he'd rake up those dry leaves in a pile there and start a fire to warm by the fire. So that's what he did. And when he started the fire, it brought more light to the cave behind him. And he turned around, and something caught his eye, and he looked, and there was a large black snake in the cave behind him. So guess what he did? He said, I'm not staying in that cave with that snake. Well, you know, that's a lot of the how sin is in our lives. The more we have Christ reflecting in our lives, the more it reveals our sins to us. And we're able to get rid of those sins in our lives. A Christian may be comfortable with sin in his life until the light of Christ reveals the true nature of that sin. And that is when a Christian should be doing something about that sin. So what I'm going to talk to you about is what this is all about. is about discipline. Learning to be more like Christ, doing what Christ wants us to do, reflecting him to the world, and to do that, we have to get rid of our sins. Think about it this way. Have you ever looked at a dirty mirror and you couldn't really see clearly in that mirror because it was, had so much dirt and grime on it, but you clean it off, sort of like my car right now, it's so full of dirt and grime, and, but you clean it off and you make it all shiny and you can look in the mirror and see everything so clear and so clean when you look in the mirror. And that's what we want to do in our lives as Christians. We want to clean it up, get these things out of our lives that shouldn't be there so that Christ can be reflected even more in our lives. To do this, we have to have discipline in our lives. Jesus noted the discipline he expects of us, his followers. In Luke 9, 23, he says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. 
Now, this is a very strong discipline that Jesus is asking of all of his followers, but he expects no less of each and every one of us. You understand that? He expects no less than each and every one of us that claim him as our Savior and Lord. We should be willing to deny ourselves completely in all areas of our life and take up our cross and follow Jesus. In one sense, salvation transforms the inner person, but Jesus expects a believer to discipline the outward life to conform to his expectations. I would love to be able to just pause right now and to just go and speak to each one of you person and say, are you willing to do this in your life? Are you willing to be 100% sold out on Jesus and allow him to bring discipline into your life to help you to get those sins that shouldn't be there out of your life? And I'm afraid so many of us would say, well, Lord, I'll give you this much of my life, but I'm keeping this over here. I'm not letting go of this. That's not what Jesus wants. He wants everything. He wants all of us. Paul explains what Jesus expects this way in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. You know, we so many times misunderstand what worship is all about. We think it just takes place here in this sanctuary. And you got to have music, and you got to have preaching, you got to have these other things in order to worship. That's not the case. Worship is any time that you bring yourself into the presence of God. When you bring yourself in the presence of God, you come in an attitude of worship to Him. And we are told here that we are, are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. He says in verse 2, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Verse 2, Do not conform to the pattern of this world. I heard the most encouraging report on the news this week. Uh, in the country of Japan, I told this to my Sunday school class this morning, uh, in the country of Japan, they have a very high uh, percentage of alcoholics in the adult population. Uh, so the younger generations, 40 and under, thousands upon thousands of them have made the pledge to give up alcohol in their lives. They have seen what it has done to their parents and to their grandparents, and they do not want it happening to them. So now, in Japan, you can find bars and nightclubs that serve non-alcoholic beverages. And they are filled to capacity with these young people who have committed themselves to give up alcohol. They, are, they have decided to no longer con to conform to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. I was telling someone this the other day, and they said, well, that will never happen in America and I thought about it, I said, no, probably not. And they said, you know why it won't? I said, why? They said, because of the, uh, the uh, industry with the advertising and all the pushing they do to make alcohol drinking look so cool in America. You know, you're smarter if you drink wine. You're cooler if you drink uh, whatever they call the beers now, microbrew or whatever it is. You know, all, and, if you, and if you know the whiskey and bourbon stuff, man, you are off the charts. You're really out there. You know, and this is all by advertising today that they have convinced us of this. And I want to tell you this, that's all the devil's garbage. That's what it is. It's the devil's garbage to destroy you, to destroy your lives. I am so thankful the young people in, in uh, Japan have opened their eyes to the truth about alcohol. They have seen it destroy people. There are people in here that could testify of members of their family that were destroyed by alcohol. I could raise my hand of some in my family. It does do that. So we are to be conformed, uh, to, to listen to Christ, to be transformed in our minds. Why must a Christian, Christian exercise self-discipline? Jesus says it's because of our human nature. For out of the heart 
comes evil thoughts. Think about that. Out of the heart, human heart, comes evil thoughts. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. He just listed 2022, didn't he, in America? Wow, and this was written uh, several hundred years ago, and he just described 2022 in America. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. For that reason, a Christian must use all diligence to discipline himself, not to give in to sin of his old nature. Don't listen to the old nature in your heart. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander, all these things are from the old human nature. We must be focused on the spirit that is in us and let the spirit guide us into all truth and God's purpose in our lives. Paul says in Titus 2, 11 and 12, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us, listen to this, this is in Titus chapter 2, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Verse 12 is going to be my verse for this year. It te- the Holy Spirit teaches us to say no, no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. I want to share with you today, if you're willing to get on the boat with this, if you're willing to really make an effort to, be, to reflect Christ in every area of your life, I want to give you some pointers today on how to discipline your life in order to truly reflect Christ in every area of your life. Now, I'm going to share with you three disciplines today, and then I will share four more with you next week. But the first discipline that I want to share with you, and these come from Elmer Towns. He's the one that came up with these, but I think they're wonderful. He says, first of all, discipline one, Christians must discipline themselves to do what God directs. Christians must discipline themselves to do what God directs. We do this by developing a, a, developing a lifestyle, listen, of praying, studying the scriptures, by witnessing to unbelievers, and by developing a positive, healthy attitude. Now look at those. I want you to look at them. Develop a lifestyle of praying. This is what, this is what we need to be doing this year. Studying the scriptures. Witnessing to unbelievers. Christians, we've dropped the ball on that. We've got to start being concerned about lost people around us. Christ expects us to be witnessing to unbelievers. And have a healthy attitude, a positive attitude. I'm going to work on that. I let all the negative around me get me into a negative frame of mind. And I'm going to work on having a positive attitude. I love being around people with positive attitudes. And so I'm going to work on having a positive attitude at all times in my life so I can reflect Christ better to the world. Through these actions, we discover God's truth and will for our lives. These truths and commands direct us in what God wants us to do, thus keeping us from sin. When you're doing what God wants you to do, you're not going to do what the devil wants you to do. So you're not going to have sin in your lives. So we need to work on these four things so that we can do what God wants us to do. I'll ask you a question right now, and you answer it honestly to yourself. Is your life directed by God? Is your life directed by God. Discipline two. Christians must discipline themselves to refrain from doing what God says is wrong. God gives us a lot of commandments in his word that tells us what not to do. Christians, we need to pay attention to that because God's commands tell us that things that can bring harm not only to ourselves but to others around us. We have the Ten Commandments. It's probably one of the best places to start with the things we shouldn't do. You shall have no other other gods before him. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet. That's where we need to start. These commandments are given to keep us from hurting ourselves and from hurting others around us. Oh, look at that list. Keep it up there for a minute. Go back. If, if Christians in their, our world would just follow these Ten Commandments, what a difference it would be in our world today. What a difference it would be in America. Christians, we've got to reflect Christ to the world. As a child of God, you should understand that God's purpose is to keep you safe by giving His commandments to us. He's keeping us safe. Think about it with a small child in your house. Uh, when you're raising a child, you've got to start by telling them one word very quickly. And what's that word? No. No. And they learn that word for their own safety. No, don't touch that hot surface. No, don't jump off that step. No, don't pick up that. Don't do this. Don't do that. That's what God's doing to us to keep us safe. He's telling us things that we should and should not do. We need and should obey God's commands with enthusiasm because God has our best interests at heart. Discipline three. Christians must discipline themselves to have a pure conscience and listen to their conscience. We need to have a pure conscience and then listen to it because it is through our conscience so many times that the Holy Spirit speaks to us and guides us in our lives. The conscience can be a moral regulator in our lives that keeps us from sinning. But the conscience has to be pure. You know, when it gets dirty, when our conscience gets dirty, it gets weak. It's not as useful as it should be. And when that happens, I, we have an air purifier in our house at home. And when, when it, the, if I don't clean the filter out on a regular basis, the, it gets weak and it doesn't circulate the air very much because there's too much filth in it. But when I take that, air, that filter out, and I wash it out and clean it out, and it's all clean again, I put it back in the air purifier, wow, the air really flows through it then again. It's able to just circulate right through it so fast. That's the way it is in our lives. We have got to let our conscience clean, help us to recognize the dirt, the filth that's there, get it out of our lives so that our conscience can be pure, so that Christ can flow even better through us and out to others around us, so that we can reflect Christ even more to the world. To be pure, you have to keep your mind on the things of God. That means we've got to get our minds off the things of this world. The devil's trying to keep us focused on the wrong things. If you watched football yesterday and it was on almost all day long, you saw at times teams seemed to get focused on the wrong thing, and they started losing. But once they gained their focus again, they were able to go in the right direction. We need to keep our minds on the things of God by being guided by the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples about the work of the Holy Spirit. He said, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit works through our conscience to recall, to recall God's commands in our heart. It, it's, it's like the Holy Spirit says, okay, you know, you know what the Word says. You know what Jesus expects of you. You should or should not do this. And we need to learn to be able to hear and listen to our conscience to the Holy Spirit guiding and directing us so that we can respond the way God would have us to respond in all situations. And with a pure conscience, we are able to avoid sin. These are the, these are the first three disciplines I want to share with you that will help you walk in God's way for your life. I have four more, as I told you earlier, that I'm going to share with you next week. But I want to just take a moment to review these three with you again. I will give you the list of all seven next week. They'll be in the bulletin. Number one, Christians must discipline themselves to do what God directs. And remember what we said? 
by prayer, by Bible study, by witnessing, and by having a positive attitude. That will help us to do what God directs us to do. Secondly, Christians must discipline themselves to refrain from doing what God says is wrong. If God says don't do it, then we don't need to do it. Got it? It's that simple. God did not make it difficult. He made it easy for us to follow him. It's the devil that makes it difficult. It's the devil that makes it difficult. God's plan is easy. The devil's plan is nothing but a maze of confusion. Discipline three, Christians must discipline themselves to have a pure conscience and then listen to their conscience. We have to be able to, be, to have a clear mind in order to hear and be guided by the Holy Spirit. I want you to stop for a moment and just think about these three disciplines. Think about in your life where you are right now spiritually. What a great time to take inventory as we start the new year. If you had to give yourself a grade on how much you are reflecting Christ to this world around us, would it be one being the worst and ten being the best? Where would you fall on that scale? How much am I truly reflecting Christ to, the, to everyone around me? Am I reflecting Christ in my home, to my family? Am I reflecting Christ to my co-workers on my job? Am I reflecting Christ to my fellow students at school? Am I reflecting Christ to those that I spend time with in my social life? Am I reflecting Christ to my community? Be honest with yourself. Where would you fall on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being I don't reflect Christ at all, and 10 being I reflect Christ all the time in my life? The goal for this year is for us to reflect Christ all the time in our lives. I want you to uh, ask yourself this question. How much time do I really spend in prayer? I've got news for you. If most of us would spend a third of the time that we do on the Internet in prayer, we would really see a difference in our lives. Amen. Secondly, how much time do you spend in Bible study? Well, you know, we offer you Bible study every Sunday here in the morning at 9.30 and great lessons in our materials. We offer Bible study on Sunday nights. We offer Bible study on Wednesday nights. Uh, then you should be having your own personal Bible study. How much time do you spend witnessing? Are you bold enough to witness to those in your own family? Are you willing to witness to those that you work with on your job? Are you willing to witness at school? Are you strong enough in your faith to witness to those at school? Are you wi willing to witness to those in the community? And let me ask you this. Most of us can tell, we can, you can answer for someone else, but answer for yourself. How many of you really have a positive attitude about life? Think about that. Now, look at the person sitting next to you, but don't say anything. Do they have a positive attitude about life? What do you think that person sitting next to you is thinking about you? You know, we need to work on that. That's discipline one. But look at these three disciplines this week. I'll give you the list next week. But I pray that all of you will be willing to get on board with me this year to be able to make ourselves the best presentation of Christ that we can to the world, that we want to reflect Christ in all areas of our lives, not just at church. You know, most of the people at church are saved. We want to reflect Christ to everyone, everywhere in our lives. Are you ready in this new year to make a commitment to God to discipline yourself in order to do God's will in your life. Would you join me in prayer? The altar will be open for anyone that would like to come forward and pray to God about this new year and make a commitment. You can come and pray with me with any decision that you might have. Maybe some of you want to start the new year. You're finally ready to give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ and you want to accept Him as Savior and Lord. 
you can come and uh, pray with me this morning. Maybe you're really to, ready to really be 100% sold out to Christ in your life. You're not going to walk on the fence anymore. You can do that this morning by coming to the altar or even where you are in your seat. Would you join me as we pray? Father, thank you this morning for helping us to look at discipline and how discipline is needed in our lives as Christians. Father, we need to be reflecting you to this world around us. There are millions of people lost, Lord, right here in America. There are millions lost right here in South Carolina. There are thousands upon thousands lost right here in Sumter, South Carolina. Father, we need to be reflecting Christ in our lives to this world around us so that they can come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Father, I pray this morning that we will get serious with you, that we will make a commitment to you today to discipline ourselves, to reflect Christ the best possible way we can every day in our lives, in every area of our lives. Father, help us to have the courage to make that commitment. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen.